welcome uh, everyone to, to this morning's uh, Facebook Live church service. I'd like to everyone and uh, welcome everyone here on Facebook Live and here in church. Uh, uh, we're doing the Facebook Live this time around because we're uh, we're uh, cleaning our church right now. So we'll let everyone know when we're open up again. And it'll be in about two Sundays. Amen. I would like to welcome everyone again. Uh, my name is Pastor Juan Lucas Jr. from the Blessing Grove Church of God Prophecy in Dallas, Texas. Welcome everyone. Uh, the Virtual Youth Camp 2020 will be from June 17th through the 19th via Facebook and Instagram. The Youth Camp Directors will be TC and April Villalobos. You can contact them at the email address apvialobos13 at gmail.com. Again, apvialobos13 at gmail.com. And the phone number to contact them is 281-831-6049. Again, it's 281-831-6049. You can also visit the website at www.txcoga.com forward slash camp for more information. Uh, at this time, I would like to... Uh, uh, remember everyone to pray for those that are being affected by the coronavirus. Uh, there has been even more infections now. That's the last statistics I, I, uh, I looked at. So please pray for the families affected by it and pray for God's healing upon uh, our people. Amen? Amen. At this time, we're speaking up offerings for uh, Sunday school, for missions, and to pay your tithes. All the information on how to send your offerings and tithes via mail or cash app is located under the title of this sermon message. Let us let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. We're asking, Lord, to give us Blessings, Father, we're thankful for your goodness and for your grace, for allowing us to live another day, Father. We're thankful, Lord, Father, for everything you've done for us, Lord, Father. We praise you and we give you honor and all glory, Lord, Father. This morning, we're thankful for allowing us to be here to be able to, uh, to, be able to uh, provide a church service live, Lord, Father. Thank you for this beautiful technology that we that can be used for good, Father. Father, I pray that we're using it for your honor and glory, Father. We're asking that you bless those, Lord, Father, that are able to give. Father, uh, uh, and, and, um, and during these offerings, Father, and I'm asking that you bless those that have a heart to give and are not able to, Father. Bless them, Father. I pray, Lord, that you bless those that want to give and are able to, Father. I pray that you multiply the missions offering, the Sunday school offering, Lord, Father. And I pray that, that, you use, that you bless it and you use it in the way you want it to in this church community, Father. We're asking, Lord, that you bless those, Lord, Father. That, that gleefully give, Father, to the, to the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord Father. I'm thankful, Lord Father, and we're asking, Lord, that you bless this, this sermon message, Father. And I'm praying that you bless it. Father, I pray that you use me for your glory and honor, Lord Father. I pray that you fill me with your Holy Spirit, Father. I pray that you bless this, uh, this offering, that you bless this, this uh, message, Father. I pray that, that, that you take away any, any opinions, any emotions, any... Uh, any presuppositions, Lord Father, or any assumptions out of my heart and mind, Father, to remove any negativity, negativity of my heart and mind, Father, and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your words, Father, so that the, the church uh, virtually can be uh, edified, Father. So those that are here, Father, may be edified as well, Father. I pray that, that today's word is a blessing, Lord Father, on Psalms chapter 1. Father, I pray that you bless them in a mighty way, Father. I pray that, that they realize that Jesus is the way of the righteous, Father. That there's a way that we must conduct ourselves as Christians, Father. Bless them, Lord, Father. I pray that, that as they listen to the word of God, that they apply it in their lives, Father. I pray this in Jesus' name, that it serves to bless them in a mighty name of Jesus, Lord. Amen and amen. Let us open our Bibles. To the book of Psalms, 
chapter 1, verse 1 and through 6. Salmos capítulo 1, versículo 1 a 6. Follow along as I read it to you. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doeth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. There are so many young people, brothers and sisters, out there who think that in order to prepare for the future and be successful, they must do and experience what other ungodly people are doing and experiencing. That kind of, this kind of thinking has swallowed up many immature Christians and eventually turned them against God. Sure, we're in the world, as Jesus says in John chapter 17, and we're exposed to non-Christian situations the school, job, the neighborhood, the community. But we need to be careful that exposure to those situations does not lead to embracing ungodly philosophies. All of us would mature faster in our faith by following the divine pattern suggested in Psalms chapter 1. First, let's not let our decisions and choices be controlled by the counsel of the ungodly. Second, we shouldn't put ourselves in a place where those who don't know Jesus can unduly influence our thought process. And third, let's avoid getting comfortable with those who mock God, His Word, and His role in our lives so that their thinking seems right to us. Counsel from such sources lead us away from God. Instead, it's best to get our training our guidance and our advice from God's holy word, the Bible, the one I'm holding right now, from God's inspired word of God, amen, and those who know it and love it. God and his word, not experiences, are our best teacher, amen. The first psalm stands in kind of an introduction to the rest of the psalms. Its subject matter is very general and basic, but it touches on two subjects that continually occur throughout the psalms. It declares the blessedness of the righteous and the misery and future of the wicked. Man's spiritual life is set forth negatively and possibly inwardly and externally, figuratively and literally. Above all else, brothers and sisters, it summarizes all that is to follow in the rest of the Psalms, and for that matter, in the rest of Scripture. It presents two ways of life, the way of the righteous, which leads to eternal life in heaven, and the way of the wicked, which leads to eternal destruction in hell. For Jesus in Matthew 7, verse, chapter 7, verse 13 through 14 says, Enter ye in a straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in their ads. In other words, there's going to be many people that reject God, that they're trying to live a life that is pleasing to them, not pleasing to God. They're walking through the, walking through the white gate, walking on the white road that will eventually lead to destruction. Amen? There's going to be many that are going to be walking through that door, that white door and, that, and, that, and walking through that broad path, doing whatever they want to do 
not caring of the consequences. Even some so-called Christians might, that, that are living a lukewarm life will be walking through that broad door that, and walking that broad path that will lead to their destruction too, brothers and sisters. Amen? And there are many there be which go in their at. Verse 14 says, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be, and look what it says, and few there be that find it. You see, there's only going to be, a, we're going to, the true Christians of God, the two children of God, the, the child, children of the king, there's, we're going to be in the minority that, walk, that, that are truly walking through that narrow, that narrow gate and walk the narrow path that leads to eternal life. A large majority, sadly, will be walking themselves through a door and walking a white path that leads to their destruction. However, the key subject is the centrality of God's word to the life and fruitfulness of the righteous who truly love his word. Two great thrusts flow out of this. A. The importance and, and absolute necessity of scripture. And B. The changed character, stability, and fruitfulness it promises to those who make Scripture the core of their values, the core of their lives. This passage helps us to reflect upon that, number one, there are three degrees of habit or conduct, walk, stand, and sit. And number two, there are three degrees of openness, Fellowship or involvement in evil, there is counsel, there is path, and there is seat. And number three, there are three degrees of evil that result. There is wickedness, there are sinners, and scoffers. In each of these, there is a regression from God's way and progression into sin and Satan's way. It warns us how man is prone to turn aside little by little and become more and more entangled in the web of sin. He is easily influenced by the way of the world in its attitudes and actions, for actions follow attitudes. The imagery of the tree is of a believer. So knowing these truths, how can a believer remain like three, like the three planted by the rivers of waters whose fruitful doesn't wither and prospers? What does it take for the tree or the believer to grow? How does one protect themselves from rotting and falling? What are the ways of the righteous? Well, first, verse 1 and 2 simply imply that you must not make decisions and choices by taking counsel of the ungodly. The word walketh in verse 1 metaphorically means in the Hebrew to go along with follow a course of action or to live follow a way of life. It has the idea of going along with, use, and follow. The text is decisive. He is one who has chosen not to follow this path. The devil is active. And will put obstacles in your way. The way and the path that leads to your spiritual destruction, he will use those who are his to hinder and hurt you. The threefold danger walking, standing, and sitting. People you surround yourself with, especially those who are not Christians, will lure, will tempt, and will speak things into your lives. That are, that are ungodly, walking in ungodly counsel. The ungodly always are ready to give advice, to give counsel. This may be in the form of literature, like, I'm okay, you're okay. This may be in the form of advertisement, like Budweiser, this Bud's for you, treat this. Or advertising like McDonald's, you deserve a break today, eat this. This may be even in the form of entertainment, like talk shows with secular opinions, 
solutions and they're focused on self-esteem, on self, on selfishness, on themselves instead of God. You see, we live in a world of vanity. We live in a world of me, me, only me. The whole entire world revolves around me. But they completely forget about God. They don't even, they don't even recognize God. They don't even acknowledge Him. You will find it in movies where violent and immoral men and women advocate revenge, up one upsmanship, material possessions, infidelity, and moral relativism. Also, in radio shows, they are full of secular psychology and opinions. There's also music that promotes sex, violence, and hatred against authority, much, what, much like what's going on right now, and mistreatment of women, like hip-hop and R&B. Any of the secular music promotes the, the mistreatment of women. They tend to disrespect women. They tend to disrespect the, uh, the, the honor of women. They tend to dishonor women. And let's not forget how ungodly some of today's children cartoons are where they suggest to our children by subliminal means that homosexuality and transgenderism is perfectly normal and acceptable behavior. And I tell you, that is not acceptable behavior. Brothers and sisters, parents, moms and daddies, it's your job to teach your children and not allow secular entertainment to teach your children. You are not to allow secular games and video games to teach your children. It is your job. It's not Facebook's job. It's not YouTube's job. It's not Google's job. It is your job to teach your children between right and wrong. What is godly or ungodly? In all of these, the secular world mocks the true God. So with all these secular and godly influences, how should you and I take decisions and make choices? Well, according to verse 2, we are to make the study of God's word right here. Open up the pages of the Bible. When it has been the last time that you have opened the Bible, brothers and sisters, honestly? When has been the last time that you opened these beautiful pages of God's word? How many times have you at least read the Gospels where the very words of Jesus are written and read in Scripture? When was the last time you opened the Bible and, and, and prayed and fasted or meditated in the word of God? You should be doing it daily. We are to make the study of God's word part of our lives, brothers and sisters, every day. It is to be one of the key purposes and affairs in our life in which we delight in and to which we give careful attention to. In other words, it should, it should be something, the Word of God should be something that should excite us. Amen? It shouldn't be a burden for us to read the Word of God. It shouldn't be a disturbance to us to, worry the word of, to read the Word of God or, or study to show ourselves approved unto God. It should not be a chore for us to open up the Bible and read the Word of God. We shouldn't have to schedule it in to be able to read the Word of God. We shouldn't have to schedule God into our lives. Like, let's say, I'm going to spend 15 minutes with God. No, that's not how it works. Whenever the Holy Spirit touches you, whenever you begin to connect with God, that is the time you spend time with God. That is the time when you open the Bible and you read the Word of God. That is something that each believer should experience in their lives. We are also to meditate on the Word of God. The verb meditate literally means to moan and to growl and to utter and to speak and to muse and to think and to plan. This is a comprehensive term for the study and application of the Word of God in one's life. There's also a second way of the righteous, or to put it simply, a second way to remain righteous, according to verses 3 and 4. And that is, not, that is by not putting ourselves under the ungodly influence. Not putting ourselves under ungodly influence. 
Standing in the way of sinners does not mean standing against them, but with them, agreeing with them. The people you hang around with regularly, you tend to be drawn to be in their likeness. Show me your friends, and I will tell you your character. So with all these ungodly influences, brothers and sisters, how should you and I be influenced? Well, according to the verse 3, we should be like a tree, a tree planted in the, by the rivers of water. What a beautiful illustration, brothers and sisters. A tree reaching down its roots in the stream, drawing life from the water. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. We are supposed to be drawn. Hallelujah. Hell, praise the Lord, the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to be of the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The rivers represent the Holy Spirit. Amen? And we're supposed to feed off from the living waters, from the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. We're supposed to be empowered by the Holy Ghost. We're supposed to feed off the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The river represents the Holy Spirit. A tree has deep roots and is usually very sturdy and especially when compared to a weed. A tree portrays stability and the capacity to withstand the storms of life. Have you ever noticed on, uh, when, when the wind blows really hard and the trees are just swaying back and forth, back and forth, and the majority of the time they don't, they, they don't, they aren't unrooted. That is how we are supposed to be, brothers and sisters. We're supposed to be stable. We're supposed to be firmly rooted in the, in the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit, fed by the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, so that when storms of life happen, we're, uh, we, aren't, we aren't unrooted from, from, from the foundation of the Word of God. Amen? It's the picture that Paul paints to the Philippians in chapter 4, verse 11 of mental, emotional, and spiritual stability in every kind of situation. Not that I speak in respect of what, for I have learned in whatever state I am, and no matter what situation I'm going through, therewith to be content. Amen? In other words, no matter what happens, I have joy. No matter what happens in my life, no matter what's being thrown at me, I have joy. And I am praising God, and I am worshiping God, and I'm giving it honor and glory. And in our weakness, we are strong. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's all about how we look at things, brothers. It's, it's all about how we handle things in a proper perspective, in a godly perspective. Amen. And whatsoever state I am, therewith be content. It also pictures the concept of growth in time. As it takes time to produce a huge sprawling oak, so it takes time to grow and mature in the Word. The problem, especially in our instant tea society, we want and expect an overnight transformation and change. But true spiritual growth, true spiritual strength, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, and 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, comes from a long-term established relationship with God and His Word. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that ye may grow thereby, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, to Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. The tree mentioned here also bears fruit. Jesus said in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches, and he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. If we remain in the word Jesus, and the word Jesus remain in us, we will bear much of the fruit spoken by Paul to the Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. 
Praise God. That is what each believer in Jesus Christ is to contain. That is what every believer in Christ must manifest through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy. In the midst of trials, in the midst of situations, we are to have joy and peace. Amen. We are to have joy. We are to have love for others. We, have, we are to have long suffering in the midst of situations, difficulties. We are to have gentleness and goodness and faith. Amen. We must definitely must have a, 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 a kind of faith that, that moves mountains. Amen. We must have a kind of faith that, 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 that defeats the enemy. Amen. Praise God. We are to have a meekness and temperance. In other words, self-control. Amen. For, for God does not give us a spirit of fear, but a love and a power and of a sound mind. Amen. We are to have a, a certain a mental self-control. Amen. Not to get angry so fast. Not to be a hothead. Amen. Not to be hot-headed. Amen. Like, kind of like many people are acting out right now in, this, in today's society, in today's situation. Amen. A lot of hotheads out there destroying things. They don't have the spirit of, they don't have to prove the spirit of love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Amen? And it says, against, their, against such there is no law. The scripture also says that just like this strong and fertile tree, his leaf or his testimony shall not wither. As long as we continue in the Lord, we will not be as the withered branch that is cast forth in the fire to be burned. As long as we walk in and stand with and sit with and delight in the ways of the Lord and everything we do for Him according to His purpose, we will prosper. We will experience a profound manifested growth in the days, in the ways of the Lord. We will experience God's work of goodness, as Paul puts it in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Because we truly love God. We truly love Him. We truly love the Holy Spirit. We truly love the Son, Jesus Christ. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Hallelujah. To them who are the called according to His purpose. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You see, God's children have God's favor upon them. Those who truly love God have God's favor upon them. It says that when we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God. You see, that is God's promise for those who love God with all their hearts, with all their souls, with all their mind, with all their strength, with every fiber of their being. Amen. He says, all things work together for the good to them that love God. To them who are the call according to God's purpose. Amen. But unfortunately for us, but fortunately for us, that's not all. There's still one more path to righteousness according to verses 5 and 6. And that is by not getting comfortable with the ungodly. You see, this is... This getting comfortable with the ungodly kind of starts for a believer. It kind of starts with being comfortable with your own Christianity. Being comfortable with your own salvation. Not working out, not, not uh, doing your part in working out your own salvation. Reading the word of God, studying, praying, and fasting, and be, being involved in the church. Amen? This kind of starts with Christianity being comfortable and just, be, and just sitting in the pew. Comfortable in your spot. Not, not getting uncomfortable in the word of God. Not getting uncomfortable in, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because Christianity is not about being, being comfortable, about being settled, about living a life that is stagnant, not where there is no growth in a believer. When, we, when Christians become comfortable, you never grow in the faith. You never grow in your walk with the Lord. You never grow because you're not opening the word of God. You never grow because you're not truly walking in the Lord. You're not truly having a true relationship with God. So because of that, later on we become lukewarm Christians. And then we start getting comfortable. And that transfers to comfortableness with the ungodly. Amen? Sitting down, as verse 5 suggests, emphasizes a thoroughly settled state or condition. Settled down, comfortable, content with the world, with its patterns entrenched in our lives. I'm afraid this is a state of 
of the majority, even of the majority of the church. Just like I was talking about, brothers and sisters. There's many Christians in Christian churches, especially in churchianity, in American church. They're just sitting down in their pews, comfortable with their lives, not even following the word of God, not even living for God. Not praying at all. They don't even have a prayer life. There's many that don't even have a Bible study life. They don't even open the Bible. They just come to church to listen to a word and then go on with their lives and live as they please. There's a lot of lukewarm Christians out there. Being comfortable and content with the world with its patterns entrenched in our lives. Past Gallup polls which compared the church and the unchurched showed that there was basically no difference in the way they lived their lives. In other words, in other words, brothers and sisters, there is no difference between the worldly and the ones that are supposed to be the church. You see, the church is supposed to be different. Amen. We're supposed to be a peculiar people. Amen. We're supposed to be different from others. We're supposed to be. We're we're not. We're we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to be of the world. We're supposed to live in the world, live our lives as, as we're supposed to, and, 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 and be us and shine the light of, of God to the people so they can see. But we're not supposed to participate in the things in the world that leads us to, to, to sin. We're not supposed to be people of the world. Jesus Christ chose us out of the world, brothers and sisters. He put us in this world so we can lead others to Christ. We're not supposed to look like the world. The church of God is not supposed to look like the world, brothers and sisters. There's supposed to be huge difference. We're supposed to be the light upon a hill. We're not supposed to hide our light. We're supposed to show the world that we are true believers in Christ. Bold in the faith. Preaching the gospel. Living the Christian life. Amen. We're not supposed to live a comfortable life that looking just like the world. Amen? We're not supposed to look like the world. Amen? Many people in the church today are comfortable with their religion. They are merely playing at church. In other words, they just show up to church just to play church. Amen? They're just spectators. They're not true worshipers of God. I come to church to worship God. Amen? And I pray that our people here come to church to worship God, not just to play church. We're not here to play church, hermanos. We're here to worship the living God. We're here to learn the word of God. We're here to study the word of God to show ourselves approved unto God. Amen? They're not... These kind of people are not advancing in their life with Christ, but are materialistic, earthly oriented, living as earth, living as earth dwellers and not sojourners. In other words, we're supposed to be passing by. We're supposed to be sojourners. We're supposed to be on a journey. Amen. They are sitting in the seat of the scornful, as verse one insinuates. In, in essence, they are getting comfortable with those who mock any and all things of God. Are you comfortable with the world, with politicians, with other unbelievers, with other people on, on, on social media mocking the word of God, using the Lord's name as fame? Are you comfortable with the movies that you watch? Are you comfortable with the shows, with the cartoons that are using the Lord's name in vain? It should bring your spirit. It should hurt you. If you're a true Christian filled with the Holy Spirit, it should grieve you. It should grieve you. It should grieve you. It should hurt your spirit. Just like it grieves the spirit, it should also grieve you. We should not be comfortable with those who mock any and any and all things of God. The word seat in the Hebrew has two meanings. Number one, a seat a place of sitting, and number two, an assembly where many are gathered together to sit and make deals or have close associations with. The point is, when you sit in someone's seat, according to, the, to this idiom, you act like or become what they are. You are viewed as, a, as in confederacy with them. 
The word scornful in the Hebrews means to mock, to deride, to ridicule, or to scoff at. Grammatically, it is a participle of habitual action. In other words, it becomes a habit for you to mock those of the things of God. And you, and you don't even stand up for what is right. You don't stand up for God when you hear someone else mock God. You should be angry when, when someone speaks ill of God. It should hurt you. It should be painful to you. When someone is, is, is using the Lord's name in vain, it becomes a habitual action for men. It refers to one who is actively engaged in putting down the things of God in his word. But please note that scoffing can can occur by declaration of words or by declaration of a way of life that scorns the moral absolutes of Scripture in its way of life. So it's not just also words, it's the way that you live that is, that is a mocking, that is scornful, that scorns the moral absolutes of Scripture in its way of life. Let me give you an illustration. A few years ago, Kathy, the son of Chick-fil-A, Founder and chairman said, I think we are inviting God's judgment on our nation when we, walk, when we shake our fist at him and say, we know better than you as, who, as, who, as, as to what constitutes a marriage, end quote, said the business leader. I pray God's mercy on our generation that has such a prideful, arrogant attitude to think that we have the authority or the audacity to define what marriage is all about. From this retrogressive process, it is easy to see that people simply do not remain pass passive about God. We can't. Passive passivity towards God in His Word leads to activity in sin and finally to overt activity against God. That is a law of life. And many do it. And many enter in in that gate that is wide and many walk in, in that broad path that leads to their own destruction to hell. So how do these people scoff at the word of God? By blatant ridicule or rejection. But there are other ways, brothers and sisters. They scoff at God by indifference. We think we have better things to do with our time. Amen? They scoff at God by substituting one's own ideas, experience, emotions, feelings or traditions for the Word of God and its principles. And there's many of that going on even in the church. They scoff at God by listening to His Word proclaimed, but then ignoring it completely. In essence, we scoff at the Word of God when we fail to obey it and order our lives accordingly. Those who mock in their ignorance the ways of God are adopting their attitudes. The road of the scornful is always downward and it leads to their destruction. What is it then that the church needs? It needs the Bible. It needs the Word of God. It needs the inspired Word of God. They need to open up the scriptures. They need to read the Word of God. They need to study to show themselves a proof unto God. What is it that pastors and elders ought to be doing? They need to be preaching and teaching the scriptures, not opinions, not attitudes, not negativity, not emotions, not opinions, not presuppositions, not assumptions, not positions, but God's holy word, God's scripture, God's word of God. Amen. What do you think Jesus prayed? Father, sanctify him by your truth. Thy word is truth. What did Paul tell his young co-worker in the faith? According to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. First he told him, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Later he wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 through 4. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Amen. Not emotions, not attitudes, not presuppositions, not assumptions or emotions or or contradictions. 
punishment, but according to the doctrine of God, according to the doctrine that is that is written in the word of God, according to the doctrine that is inspired by the word of God. Brothers and sisters, not man's doctrine, not church doctrine, but the doctrine that is written in the word of God. And then he quickly warned in verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Watch out, brothers and sisters. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. In other words, there's going to be a lot of people, and even now, are searching for, for preachers, searching for, for, for motivational speakers. Not really preachers, not really ministers of the truth, not ministers of the sound doctrine of God. They're trying to, that when preachers are teaching them and preaching them things they want to hear. Because that they itch in ears and they need some, they need a word that will scratch the itch that is in their ears. They just want to hear what they want to hear. They don't want to hear the truth because they get offended so easily. They're too sensitive. Amen. And they get offended when, when the truth is preached to them. They don't want to hear the word of God. They don't want to hear the sound doctrine of the word of God written, rooted in the word of God. They don't want to hear Holy Spirit filled messages. They don't want to, they don't want to feed off from the power of the Holy Ghost. And sadly, all they're going to be listening to is fables, lies, deceitfulness, untruthfulness, unworthiness. And it says, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. Say, I don't want to hear that. That's not the Jesus that I know. That's not my Jesus. That's not my God. Those are people with itching ears, brothers and sisters. That is not what the truth is. Yes, the truth sometimes is hard. Sometimes it's sweet. You see, the word of God is balanced. You see, God is a, is a God of balance. Amen. If I preach about heaven and hell, I must preach about repentance and, re and, and redemption. I must preach a word of God that is balanced according to how it's written, according to how it's inspired and written in the word of God. Not my own opinions, not my own presuppositions, not my own opinions or anything that, or any of my thoughts. It's what the word of God says, brothers and sisters. So that they can hear the truth. Because the truth will indeed set them free. Amen. And you shall hear the truth. And the truth shall set you free. And you shall be free indeed. Watch out for these dangers. Notice the progression. Amen. The progression to. Their own destruction. Walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Just notice the progression. But this is a progression that leads them to hell. Walking in the counsel of the ungodly, accepting their advice, standing in the way of sinners, being a party to its ways, sitting in the seat of the mockers, adopting its attitudes. If you desire to walk in the path of righteousness, let God's word fill your heart. Let it fill your memory. Let it fill, let it rule your heart. Let it guide your every way of life. Let it guide. Uh, let it be a light to your feet and a light to your path. Amen. You got to remember the path is narrow. The door that you walk through is narrow. Let God's word guide you in a narrow path. Let it be a lamp to your feet so that you know when, when to take the next step. Amen. Let the word of God light your way so you know which direction to go to, which direction to walk to. Amen. Praise God. May God find you faithful and sincere and honest and committed and dedicated to the word of God, to that walking, to standing and sitting with Christ. Amen. Not sitting with the world. Not sitting with the ungodly. Settling with their attitudes. Allowing their attitudes to influence you. When you take a stand to walk the way of the righteous, when you take a stand for what's right according to God? Will you take a stand for what's right, for what's righteous, for what is God? I invite all of you this morning 
to bow your heads and come to the altar of prayer and pray to the Lord. Come into the presence of the Lord this morning. Everyone that's on Facebook Live right now watching, bow your heads. Come to the altar. Get on your bended knee and seek God to touch you. Seek God to have his way with you. Seek the Holy Spirit to fill you, your heart, to fill, to rule your heart. Ask God to help you understand, to open up the scriptures to you. If you're one of those that struggle with understanding the word of God, ask God, ask Jesus to help you. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead you into all truth. If you don't believe in, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, God is inviting you. I am inviting you. The word of God is inviting you. The Lord is inviting you to repent of your sins and seek his forgiveness. He's inviting you to, to he's compelling you right now. He's inviting you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and King over your lives. He wants to, uh, get, he wants to give you a heart of flesh. He wants to take away your heart of stone, all that bitterness that you're holding right now, all that hatred and grudge you're holding right now. He wants to remove that heart of stone. He wants to give you a heart of flesh. He wants to pour his spirit in you and cause you and compel you to obey his word, to walk in his ways, to live a life that is pleasing to him and not pleasing to the world. The world is not going to save you. Only God can save you. Only Jesus saves. Only Jesus forgives. Father God, thank you, Lord, this morning. Father, I'm asking that you reach out to those that you're speaking to their hearts right now. Father, I pray for those that you're speaking to their minds, that you're speaking to their hearts and their souls right now, Father. I pray that those that are struggling with understanding your word. Father, I'm asking you that you open up their eyes to see. Give them, an, give them the eyes to see. Give them the ears to hear. Give them heart to deserve the truth. Open up the words to them, Father. Open up your holy word to them, Father. Give them revelation to them. Speak to them through your word, Father. Father, I pray for those that are, that are, that are, that are staying stagnant in their, in their beliefs, they are staying stagnant in their faith. Father, help them grow in their faith. Help them to be true believers of Christ. Help them uh, get out of the ways of, of lukewarm Christianity a fake Christianity, but, but follow the ways of the Lord, to walk in the ways of the Lord, to walk that narrow path that leads to righteousness, to walk that narrow path that leads to eternal life. Father, help them and guide them and be with them, Father. I know that your word says that you never leave us.